All right, so I think I'm going to get started here. Um, so in the morning, I talked mainly about the uh, open source Jenkins project. But uh, in these 30 minutes, I wanted to talk about what the CloudBees, my company, does in and around Jenkins. So during the keynote, I talked about you know, this importance of the software driving this, well, software driving this important change in the industry that the, um, you know, the, because of that, we are asked to do more and more software development faster and faster. And as a result of it, we, you know, the continuous delivery is, uh, is seen as a very important way to get to that speed of the faster software delivery, right? So that's the kind of the context that I want to start from. Now, when you actually think about what it takes to do the continuous delivery, on one hand, you hear from these amazing companies that seem to be killing it, right? Some of you might have heard that the Netflix and the Amazon are deploying like a hundred times of the day, that their software is a very, like a const, in constant flux. So that's a kind of great story that the, the sort of the high achiever is, is, is attaining. And it kind of almost feels like these are, they are like the tigers roaming around the earth with such confidence. And that's who you want to be. Now, on the other hand, if you actually look around, then what you see is nothing like that, right? And many people, I mean, I personally talked to a number of people who had using the Google Docs as a, the, to coordinate the deployment, uh, or that the, uh, they have the operation persons going through the night to get the deployment while, let's say, the, the application is down, uh, or uh, you might be only deploying every once in six weeks, or um, the, you know, the every once in quarter, or things like that. So when you are at that point, you know, and then you hear about these amazing companies, it just sometimes feels like this gap between where you are and where you want to go sometimes feels just so vast and just simply impassable. Right? And then at that point, you kind of get lost, and then you, you know, just you kind of give up on the whole thing because you don't even know how to start. And then to make the matter worse, I think when we often talk about the technologies, it has this effect of even confusing you further, right? We talked about different people have different take and different facets of the DevOps, so the continuous delivery, and all this results in this kind of endless confusions. Um, and then, you know, you know, it's a bit of a analysis paralysis. So you don't know, again, you don't know where to start it, and then you can you kind of give up your hands saying, well, I'm going to work on the next releases. And yeah, while, for a while, you can be doing, you can ignore the problem for a while. But as I showed you in the earlier in the keynote, down the, down the horizon, you have a storm gathering. So you really need to start thinking about how to get there. So in the face of all these confusions, uh, what the, at Clavis, what we started telling people is you kind of want to step back a bit and think about one, you know, the identify where you are at the moment, right? Like I said, continuous delivery and DevOps is a journey, and everyone kind of has to start from somewhere. So the, the good step to think about this is first step back and identify where in the journey you currently are, and then where you want to go, right? That's a goal state. And then between those two things, uh, think about how to get from where you are and where you want to go. So when you try to think about the journey from that perspective. One way you can think of it, uh, that we, start using this, we started using this, I guess, the mental framework to help people understand how to map this journey. And that's what we call this uh, quadrant, right? So let's see, I can't point things from here, so let's see. Um, so on this axis, what we are trying to do, on this x-axis, what we are trying to map is the software development life cycle. So toward the left, we have the upstream. Toward the right, we have the more downstream operational concerns, right? So as the word DevOps indicate, you know, the sometimes uh, the, the challenges exist between bridging the upstream side of the people to the downstream side of the people, right? They often have the sort of organizational differences and cultural differences. So what this is trying to show you is as you scale up the, the continuous delivery, at some point, you do need to cross this gap, right? So that creates a one set of unique challenges. So that's the, that's the vertical white line that I'm trying to map here. 
Now, another axis I put uh, toward this very left in here uh, is the scale in which you're doing the DevOps. Right? So it's one thing often people start small, meaning there's like a one young engineer that's very passionate in the team, and uh, he, you know, he or she discovers Jenkins and put that in the, the computer, and then well, his team is now productive. But that kind of the, the mode of uh, CICD that relies on the local the motivated person is a very different thing from enterprise-wide deployment, right? So now you're trying to scale this up to the entire organizations, meaning you have to sort of be able to educate the people at mass, train them, and then sort of build the process and then set the expectations, and then sort of guide people through and measure the progress. So you can't simply take this local success and expect that to replicate on its own to the larger environment. So the line, the white line that's going in between here, we are trying to show that gap, you know, this, this hurdle that the people going through this journey has to cross to get to that, uh, get to that, um, get to that scale. So um, obviously, so if, if you use this like a two axis to divide up the entire landscape, you get four quadrants, right? So the quadrant one uh, is maybe for the people yeah, if we have like a little pocket of uh, good Jenkins, right? these heroes who managed to put some things together. Uh, in the quadrant two, which is here, uh, would be, you know, again, this local team successfully kind of involving the more sophisticated part of the ops to at least, let's say, make something work for one app. And then from there, you kind of hope that you'll be able to scale this up across organizations. Now, obviously, everyone is trying to go, get to this uh, stage four, right? Um, it's kind of hard. So the, what, you know, the companies at this point, at, at, at that quadrant, would be able to achieve the faster software delivery um, or the increased productivity, right? As a result, you can respond to the market forces more quickly, right? Every time we try to build some product, there's inherently some bet in it, right? You don't exactly know which part of it would be appreciated by your audience and which part is not so much. So being able to see that reaction in the community in the, in the, among the users and use that information back in the product development is a critical part of getting the right software out of the market, out to the market more quickly. And then that, the, that obviously translates into the competitive advantage for the people who are, I guess, the more in the management that directly translates to the bottom line and perhaps also not the, uh, it's the last but not least, you know, the, the good engineers enjoy working in this kind of sophisticated environment, right? So often, the larger companies have challenges acquiring and retaining good talents because they, these places are seen as less cool, right? The people who, 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 people who are good wants to kind of work in a different environment. So part of the benefit of your getting to the quote on four um, is for you to be able to keep your employees, keep your engineers happy and satisfied, and then they bring in the other like-minded people, uh, and then that way, your, your sort of the DevOps initiatives gets so much more easier. Um, and uh, just to illustrate this kind of uh, difficulty of crossing the chasm of these, like, uh, the boundaries, right? the developers, the think people on the left-hand side and operations people who are on the right-hand side has, um, very different goals and motivations. So engineer's goal is to build the more features and get that in the hands of the more, more, uh, more users. So they like faster changes, they're willing to take on new things, but the operations people, their responsibility is to keep things up and running. So for them, the best software is a software that does not change because change is the time in which things start to break. So the, it's kind of difficult to sort of crossing this, like a connecting this inconsistent goal into one effort, and that's why we sort of call out for this cross-functional team of people who sort of share, who work around the same applications, right? Now, if you look at the, uh, some of the common adoption patterns, then uh, what we see uh, might be something like this, right? So the people start, let's say, local CICD, I mean, local continuous integration practices on this end, right? And over time, that success got picked up by the, uh, by the organization and tried, you know, that got scaled up. And then the harder integration of the developers and the operations people 
uh, the, are attempted only toward the end. So that would like, you know, paint the journey like that. Now, but the more and more, I think, nowadays, uh, the, the kind of, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, the adoption cycle that we are seeing, I think, is starting to change a little. Uh, partly, in a way, when something is harder, like this crossing, going from like, connecting dev side of the house and op side of the house, it's important that you actually prove that force. Right? So in those places, what we, what we started to see more and more is this team level success of CI activity kind of spread its, uh, its uh, tentacles through the downstream. Right? With modern runtime like uh, the Docker and then the Kubernetes and so on, this kind of uh, one team owning the entire application delivery cycle becomes much easier than before. And then once you have that, that sort of like a whole CD cycle automated, then you, the, the rest of the organization can rally around that success and then they scale up from there and then try to line up the entire sort of business to this new mechanism. So, so that's good. Um, and then this is, when people are trying to do this kind of journey, um, they generally find Jenkins to be a critical piece of the puzzle uh, because it's sort of, it's a kind of the foundational force. It's the basic force to be a part of this, every cycle of the software deployment automation from the uh, testing, the pull request, all the way down to driving the deployment and then feeding the result back into the upstream. And naturally, the fact that the Jenkins has this huge ecosystem and the you know, 1,300 plugins uh, that connects to everything uh, certainly enables this kind of usage. Now, I mean, the, in some sense, people in the stream, I assume, the, you know, are for this kind of thing is uh, already, already kind of obvious, right? But now, as you start to rely on Jenkins more and more, and then start using it, you start to develop these um, the common challenges. Right? So the one, for example, if you're larger organizations, uh, you discover that the various different pockets of your teams independently started using Jenkins. I call it the Jenkins sprawl. Um, th those are the reasons we get to have uh, uh, the uh, 150,000 installation or whatever. Uh, but from an organizational perspective, this is not ideal. Right? Or the, another problem uh, is that the sort of, you don't need really to have the good sense of what plug who is using what plugins, that the different teams might be using different versions of plugins, and that a local Jenkins export, you're asked to kind of help them all, but without some inconsistency, it's, it's going to be difficult for you to scale to help the larger group of people, right? Here's another one. The you know, enterprise, they, you know, they care about the things like security, but the developers, this is not high on their mind. So when they are the ones that's setting up Jenkins left and right, they don't necessarily worry about these things. They don't understand why these things are important for the organizations. Now, if you can, but so, you know, you either have to go af chase after them to try to fix it, then, then you kind of look like a, the bad guy or the, uh, and it's, it doesn't put you in a good, good spot, right? Or how about this impact of the downtime as more and more people put the workload in Jenkins? Um, and then, you know, it's, it's a little bit like a, the early on is good, right? But as you start putting more workload and more workload into Jenkins instance, un unless you manage it well, at some point, it kind of starts to crumble down and become slow and then like become unreliable, right? And you really don't want that to happen because at that point, your usage of Jenkins becomes kind of critical. Um, and then uh, the performance stability issues I talked about or the monitoring, uh, the lack of monitoring, what that means is when things, you have no for, uh, the warning up front to see when the problem might strike you, right? So, that kind of problem, I think many of you have these sort of problems that you might have felt it. So that's, this is the kind of challenges that the clubbies are helping around the world, right? So our mission is sort of the help the, um, the, we, we, our mission is to help companies solve this enterprise scale continuous delivery problems. Uh, and then we do that you know, by things like uh, providing the support, providing the security features, improving the manageability and scalability of Jenkins, uh, again, so that the enterprises can rely on, create this reliable Jenkins as an infrastructure and provide that as a service to the rest of the companies. So I guess one way that I often explain this is what the cloud is does to Jenkins is to what Red Hat does to Linux. 
Right? There's this viable community that's creating, doing lots of interesting experiments, creating the driving innovations. And on the other hand, there's this company who is kind of picking up the interesting bits and then create more coherent solutions or distributions and provide support and so on, so that the enterprise doesn't have to go pick up these bits by yourself or that they have to take on the responsibility, common responsibility of stabilities and so on. So, you know, we kind of sort of the marry the power, harness the power of the uh, innovation of the community to what the enterprise needs. So, uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, this is the architecture diagram for the, or one of the products, the Jenkins Enterprise. So, what we do, you know, in the larger places, in larger organizations, imagine you have, you know, the hundreds of applications, maybe tens of teams, they, you need to provide the CICD as a service. So what do you want to do, right? You don't want to get to the point, you don't want to get to the state where you need to install the individual Jenkins masters and configure them and so on. So in your solution, what we provide is you can pull together this series of virtual machines into a single pool, right? And then on top of that pool, our software comes in and manages containerized Jenkins masters or the build agents or the other supporting services uh, like this operation center, right? And then our system kind of takes care of uh, the, the load balancing and stuff like that. So let's say your workloads start to grow, then well, all you need to do is just bring in another virtual machine. Right? So you, you can just have a pool of it and then people can put workloads on it and they're isolated and then the whole thing kind of just work, works without you spending too much effort in babysitting it. And then from the, uh, the administrator's perspective, you get this like a single console to manage the whole system you know, they upgrade the entire master cluster or the, that sort of stuff. Um, the Jenkins administrator uh, get to use this as a self-service Jenkins environment. Right? So these are like, uh, you know, people in the team who are capable of configuring Jenkins and they can do those things. And a developer can use this uh, like a, as a single, single big services um, and then be able to just you know, use that like how they normally use Jenkins. But the behind the scene, all this software makes the job of the administrator so much easier. Um, all right, so the another thing we do is, you know, the power of the Jenkins kind of comes from this plugin ecosystem, right? We have all these pieces that can be combined in very flexible way, quite a powerful way to do it. But the, for the enterprise, the fact that you have to individually, you don't want to let the individual teams or the uh, uh, take on this assembly work, or for that matter, you don't want to take on that work yourself. You just want to think combination that works well. So that's kind of um, what, the, what, the, what the Cloud Beast does. So instead of asking you to assemble these Legos into your functional cars that you could drive, we give you, based on our best experience of which plugins are the better ones and what, what you should be using to combine which versions works better, they give you a ready-made car that you can drive that looks you know, reasonably nice, right? And then we hire this team of Avengers, uh, and then what they do is we take, they take on these plugins, uh, and then they connect, combine them into one distribution, kind of like how the Red Hat creates a Linux distribution, uh, and then we make sure that they work and they form a consistent, coherent pieces together. Uh, and then we test those and we make sure that they are workable and provide them as a, like a regular periodical update to the customers. So as a user, like you don't have to worry about when to update which plugins to what versions, and worry about uh, you know, the, uh, the particular upgrade breaking things or that sort of things. So the update, the entire Jenkins upgrade process kind of becomes excitingly boring, right? You don't want updates. I know many of you feel a little bit nervous when you're trying to update plugins. Now this becomes kind of a painless work of uh, you know, the monthly update or like a buy, a quarterly update or whatever pace that you choose. So that's a key part of what we do. Um, uh, the, another from the feature perspective, the one of the sort of behind the scene piece that uh, you can benefit a lot is the uh, operation center, what we call the CloudBees uh, Jenkins Operation Center. So this is kind of like a brain that coordinates, it's a master of masters. It coordinates, uh, it helps the, the administrator manage the large number of Jenkins by doing things like um, uh, the, you know, custom, creating a custom, allowing you to create a custom plugin update center uh, to distribute the updates, 
uh, or the you know, do perform some cluster-wide operations um, and so on. Um, and uh, collectively, you get this kind of uh, architecture where all the masters in the system gets driven by a, a single operation center. Right? So, so those are sort of the, the stories focused around how to make sure your Jenkins environment is scalable and stable for the enterprise. But that's not the all of the story, right? So we also help you achieve continuous stability more, more effortlessly and smoothly. So one thing that the larger organization needs or benefits a lot is a kind of templating, right? You don't, again, you don't want the individual application team to, to be doing things differently, right? You want to drive some sort of enterprise best practices or consistency. And then by asking people to follow it in exchange, they get the simpler, well-proven road that they don't have to think too much about. So we have a number of features that collectively allows you to do these kind of things and make it so much more easier for the product team to use Jenkins without necessarily knowing much about how to use it. Right? The more and more companies are doing this Docker-based development, I'm kind of running out of the time, so I'm going to have to start hurrying up here. Uh, but uh, we, our solution help you do that. Um, and uh, the pipeline has some extra capabilities in the Jenkins or uh, in our CloudBees products, right? So you can, uh, you can do that. Uh, we have some additional templating capabilities around Jenkins pipeline in ways that make people don't even need to write the Jenkins file at all. And then we also help you track this adoption of CI CD through various numerical metrics, which you can use to measure the adoption of CI CD inside the organizations or plan the capacity of the system and that sort of things. And uh, maybe the last bit, I think, uh, on the topic of uh, security, I think uh, the, in many organizations, this segregation of the duties or making sure that no single person can't do the bad stuff, I think is an important compliance goals. So the, you know, our product helps you achieve that through on the Jenkins by providing this role-based access control functionalities that allows the central team to, to make sure that the policies are enforced and then allow the local teams to map people to these roles. Um, and then to support these like, software features is, the, uh, this is another part of the subscription. Right? So we help you, uh, we provide the Jenkins support from our experts and that help you run and then use Jenkins correctly. Um, so, uh, the, so one of the things we do, um, uh, is uh, this knowledge space support. So instead of, uh, well, we obviously do this like, a, you know, the technical troubleshooting and so on, but what we really wanted to do is more proactive support, right? Before you, the technical support is, troubleshooting support is kind of bad because by the time you get there, you're having a problem. But rather, what we want to do is to set you on the right direction in the beginning, right? So that you don't even end up going to the wrong direction that has lots of potholes. So we call those a knowledge-centric support, uh, allow, allows you to sort of share our best practices, our experience of uh, seeing the lots of customers using Jenkins, help you kind of drive toward the right directions. Um, and obviously, we do technical support. So let's say if the Jenkins is going down or if it's very slow, you need to understand why that's the case and you need to fix it. So we help you do that. Uh, we have a lot of people in the community. We, we have, you know, we keep hiring the people from the community to the point that it's kind of becoming a problem on its own. But we have a lot of experienced people, and I, you know, I used to participate in this support of myself. Right? Um, and then we, we also try to sort of do more successful, more planning upfront about the success. Right? So, you know, kind of going back to our journey description, we want to understand what your journey, where you're trying to go, and then sort of based on that understanding, we can help you match your features uh, to what you're trying to do. Right? So that's the kind of uh, the work that we do. Um, and then the, you know, the, according to our survey, the 99% of the customer, when they respond to your support ticket, said they are happy uh, with what they got from the customer support. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we provide uh, various, you know, the training, consulting, professional services, that kind of things. Um, and so that sort of is a quick uh, view in tour of what the cloud is does in around uh, Jenkins. So um, I think that's kind of a bring me on the right time, I think. So thank you very much. And uh, do I have time to take any questions?
Yeah, okay, great. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer some of those. How long does it take since uh, an OSS plugin releases a new version until you certify it and include it in your distribution? So, right, so I think the question is, okay, so when the community releases a new plugin, new version of plugin, how, you know, what's the time frame or how does trickle, how does that end up into this bundle of the certified distribution, right? So again, we have this team of Avengers like looking into that sort of things. Um, and um, the, the speed in which that, that, that change can happen kind of depends on the nature of the change. Right? So some plugins, you know, the, some plugin updates are very small and then we can pick that up easily. Others are more consequential. So we had uh, some, some cases of a lower level plugin making a significant change that has this ripple effect to the other plugin that was depending on it. So those we have to be more careful. So I can't really make a blanket statement about the time frame, but that's, the kind, that's precisely the kind of body I think we provide it, so that we, we understand what are the changes made in these plugins and then find the right moment to put that into the distributions. All right, anyone else? Okay, I guess I, I guess that, that'd be it then. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you. <laughs>